talk about that a little bit. We're in that season, but I felt like the, this Pentecost is unique. I think the Lord's going to really bring a, a really download of power, revelation, insight, compassion, uh, like we've never seen before. And uh, I tell you, the women's thing, I don't know how it went yet, but I, I, I could feel it. I was over there just a little bit on Saturday. I could feel it. My wife has been uh, shaking for uh, three days before she even got to the, the retreat. And not because of the anxiety of the retreat, just because of the power. And, and she doesn't do that as much as I do. I mean, when I have these kind of encounters, she's been having these encounters. And the Lord, I kept thinking, are you, are you having a breakdown or something? Is there something wrong? You know, because she hasn't really been as much in that realm as I have, you know. And that's really, really amazing. Something's up. And uh, just a new level of... Uh, receiving the presence of the Lord and also on the Sunday night which we never do a Sunday night service but it's going to be unique I've done this for several years whenever I have a Sunday night a Pentecost on Sunday when I when I do a Sunday night service like this what I found is I have we've hollowed out a place of special grace for anyone that would like to receive a prayer language or like to speak in tongues for the first time uh, would like to receive an impartation of the Father's love all of that uh, we just do a night where we're just geared toward that. So there's kids that come, like little nine, ten year olds. We pray for them. We pray for, like last time we did this, we had like 25 people receive their prayer language and get baptized in the Spirit. And just a special night. So I preach on Pentecost like I'm going to do here today. I speak on it a little bit, pave the way, and the Lord honors it. And it's just a special anointing. I do this in my life in the Spirit classes all the time, but many times people can't make those classes. They have relatives or friends. So that's going to happen on Sunday night of the worship weekend of this Seek the Lord conference. And then on Monday night, if you've never heard this, it's the most unusual worship I've ever heard in my life. I'm not saying something because I've seen a lot of worship. But Jake Hamilton is touching something. It's going to be young, I'll warn you. Very young. It's, uh, it's meaning that there's a lot of noise, and a lot of sound, a lot of things. But, but not just... It's unique. It's something... I, uh, last time he was here, I was flabbergasted because I've heard him before. But I was... It was like two... Two and a half hours of just constant worship, and it's just something that uh, the style of it, the whole way he was doing it, was just remarkable. It was a fitting end to our our three day weekend. It's going to be amazing after worship in three three days, and then coming to that on Monday night. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend you bring friends, neighbors, people saved, unsaved uh, on that Monday night. Because we always have a Monday night service, but this one is really one of those nights that you you don't want to miss. And uh, Last time he came, I, I wasn't expected. I got ambushed. I had forgot because he hadn't been here in a few years. And so I'm remembering really strongly now what happened the last time he was here. It was amazing. All right. So he's going to be with us on that Monday. So I want to talk today, <clears throat> just remind us of some concepts and remind us of some experiences that are so incredibly important to our walk with the Lord. Now, you would call us a Pentecostal, a charismatic, or whatever you want to say church but sometimes that very label inoculates us from actually receiving sometimes you can talk about something but forget that you're actually supposed to actually have a personal encounter with god on a daily basis Not only supposed to <laughs> supposed to is a really weird say to say you get to and to keep that value high is so important because sometimes when we let that value even in the midst of our conversation die that you actually need to receive personal supernatural encounter with God all the time <laughs> then it clarifies everything then we kind of be going more to where we should be and if I wouldn't go this direction if it wasn't the Bible you know that Bible it always is getting into the strangest of places your Bible just read your Bible <laughs> read the New Testament the Old Testament I, I kid it with people a lot of times when I'm talking to them you know because they get hung up over a certain phenomena or a certain thing and I'm saying what 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 are you hung up about? You're the weirdest person on the planet already. If you just basically received Jesus Christ, guess what? You believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. You believe that God actually had this union with a human being and that this person that was born, his name is Jesus, he's both God and man. He wasn't just a man. You believe that his blood trickling down from a cross 20 centuries ago brings forgiveness to your sins today. You believe that this same person whose atonement 
wipes away your sins and makes it possible that I have the same person rose from the dead. That's what you believe if you're a Christian. You've come a long way, baby, already just being a Christian. And you mean to tell me that you have a little problem that the Holy Spirit might make you shake or He might speak to you or He might heal your body? You've already come that far and those little things are hanging you up. You're weird. You're already weird if you're a Christian. So I'm just going to tell you today how much weirder you are than you maybe even know. And also to learn to cope with the supernatural. You see, the whole thing that happened with regard to the coming of Jesus was not only that He did all those things for you, but He cleared the way for you to have a living and dynamic supernatural relationship with Him. I say supernatural relationship with Him because it's that's exactly what we're talking about. And it's at the core of everything that we are as Christians. We even have Christ in our name. But it's not Christ in our name from a distant historical figure. It's Christ in your name from a living, active, powerful force that heals and, and wants you to be a part of that healing process and taking your name out and causing miracles and signs and wonders and experiencing the depths of His love. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about somebody alive, somebody that's living, somebody that wants to be your friend, but more than that, wants to love you like a child. Wants to hear you say Abba and mean it. Wants you to feel his touch. So, at the end of Acts, we read all these incredible stories and everything, but there's a question Paul asked to a group of people in Ephesus. He found some disciples. He thought they were probably Christians, but he decided to ask a question of them. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That was his question. He was trying to figure it out. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Because he knew there was something different about it, but there was something that he could tell wasn't quite like the normal Christians of his day. So he's thinking, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they became Christians. But the next thing in the story is just ordinary New Testament Christianity. The way it's written in the book, the way it all happened, the way that the early Christians understood God. Paul placed his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues of prophecy. That was normal fare. You come to know Jesus Christ, you get baptized, and then you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So this baptism of the Holy Spirit is it the key? It's a key question for today, not just for one time, way back when, but did you receive the Holy Spirit today when you believed? Since you believed in Jesus Christ, have you felt His touch? Have you felt His anointing on your life? Are you walking in a supernatural way with the Lord? Christianity starts with learning to be a good receiver. I've said it so many times, but it's the truth. There's a lot of do things you can do and a lot of uh, should things in the Bible. But Christianity and the great change that happened at the cross and the resurrection with the coming of the Spirit, that great change is predicated, foundational, found based on learning to be a good receiver. Because you can't do what Jesus asks of you. You can't be who you're supposed to be. You can't experience what you're supposed to experience without God Himself. The great miracle is, you know it by your name, Christ, John, Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That he's not just hanging around, lounging around, around somewhere. He's vibrating your heart. He wants to work through you and he wants to be in you vibrantly every day. At salvation, we believe and we receive who? Jesus. We receive forgiveness. We receive eternal life. Amazing that story is about this whole receiving posture is that thief on the cross. There he is on the cross. He didn't do one thing, not one thing to earn the favor of God. And he just said, remember me, please. I believe you. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. See, this Christianity is the receiving movement. It is a receiving movement. So we're just going to talk about the various ways that we receive. Starting with salvation. Now Jesus, on the first night of his resurrection, which is so uh, wonderful, these words that we get to read and see the history of it and the whole thing. In John chapter 20, we read, he, he appears to his disciples. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in the morning. But in that evening, he, 
that he uh, appears to the whole group of disciples. And they heard little whispers and rumors, hey, the guys in Emmaus saw him and everything, but there he is, in the flesh, appears, right? And it's amazing, if you look at John chapter 20, on that evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, they're kind of waiting to know what, what comes next. Jesus came and stood among them, and I find it very interesting what comes next, okay? Jesus said to them, peace be with you. That could be like shalom. The word shalom uh, could express that phrase. Just said, hi. And with it, there's the implication of may God's peace, may God, everything that comes with peace be with you, right? The word shalom. But after this, he showed him his hands and his side. You can see, here you go. It's really me. Here's my side, you know. And then it says, disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus says, peace be with you. And then he gets to the business at hand. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So don't worry about this because the next thing he does, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. So, hello, I'm sending you. <coughs> receive the Holy Spirit. That's pretty direct. All right. But it's really important. It's simple. I feel like I'm in a, uh, can you get rid of that? So, it's pretty simple, isn't it? See the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Go out there. <laughs> but you need to be equipped. You need someone supernatural on the inside of you. You breathe in. Now, how many of you believe that when the Son of God looks you square in the eye and breathes on you and says, receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the Holy Spirit? So, I'm going to establish that. They didn't just sort of, <sighs> this is the day of the resurrection. Receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I guarantee you, something happened on the other side. Emotionally, mentally, physically, guarantee you. So, the odd thing is, he appears to them over a period of 40 days. So you in my Life in the Spirit class, a number of you have been through this, but I'm just bringing this a refresher because I believe that we're in another time of impartation. God's about to do something in the next several weeks, and even this summer that uh, we've never seen before, on a level we've never seen. And I felt the Lord told me to tell you to prepare. And I just want to remind you where we come from, that we don't come from a place that's just sort of a latest fad or kind of a nice idea or a thought or kind of, oh, those are the really, like I thought when I first came to the vineyard, frankly, I thought those are the hyper-emotional, like a little bit of balanced, little walk on the wild side kind of Christians. But biblical, ah, a little light on that. Well, let's just go to our Bibles and say what it really says, okay? Let's get rid of all of our secular humanism, all of our secular way of looking at life and look at how crazy how amazingly spiritual these people were, these early believers, and then let's see what that has for us, all right? That's why I'm talking this way, and I talk this way a lot, but so I know I'm preaching the choir, but I want you to know there's biblical reasons we're coming out of these scriptures here for the basis of everything. We're just doing what we see in the scripture. Things that I used to pass over as a Presbyterian kid all the time, matter of fact, just scratch my head and wonder and ask all my leaders about it continually, you know, because when you read through the New Testament and you're a kid, you're 16 years old, and they actually are trying to get you to read through the Bible, and you actually read it, and you look at all the angels and the power and the demons flying out and everything, and you ask honest questions that nobody can answer, just made me so curious. Uh, you know, you got me reading this Bible, and I'm reading it. I don't see any of this in our church. Where is it? Where do people get raised from the dead? Where do people get demons cast out? Where, where is all this stuff? I was so hungry. I was so incredibly hungry because I just read my Bible. I don't know why people read the Bible and don't get hungry for this sort of thing. Because like, they assume, because of their background, that just doesn't belong at this time and age or whatever. They don't see, a lot of other churches aren't walking it. But I tell you what, it's never changed since all of the activity we've had since the turn of the 20th century and then all the way back through the centuries. The question still is, did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believe? And I'm going to explain to you that he's not talking about salvation. Obviously, he's talking about this baptism. It's part of Luke's nomenclature, as we're going to see. He has various synonyms for this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So anyway, 40 days later, Jesus appears. And he has this little talk with him in Acts chapter 1. Now remember, they've already had this encounter with the Holy Spirit, right? Receive the Holy Spirit. But the odd thing is, when we get to Acts uh, chapter 1, he says, don't leave Jerusalem, verse 4. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, they had no clue, still. 
they had received this impartation, but they, they still weren't getting it. They weren't, they weren't grasping what he was really trying to do. When he used this word baptize, which means immerse. They still weren't grabbing at a whole hold. And you know, I tell you, uh, many of us, including myself, I have to continue to revi re remind myself because all around me is the secularness of our culture, the secularness of much of Christianity. And then the other part of it is just raw disappointment, discouragement, things I haven't seen move in my life that I wanted to see move, leading I haven't received, uh, jobs I need, healing I need, uh, uh, broken relationships. You know, and sometimes in all of that stuff, I lose this, the basic supernaturalness of who God is in my life and what He wants to do. And so, we look at Acts chapter 1. He says, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water in a few days. You'll be baptized. You'll be immersed with the Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> they replied with a political question. <laughs> and interestingly enough, he gives them a political answer. Well, well, the one, well, it wasn't the one they were looking for. It's not for you to know the times or dates. The Father is sent by his own authority. Israel didn't come back till for 2,000 years. It took 2,000 years. <laughs> that one sentence had 2,000 years built into it. Can you imagine? But here's the issue today. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then we read in Acts chapter 2, 10 days later, what we celebrate is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost came, verse 1 of Acts 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And the people around are hearing them speak in their own language and they're going, what? I thought, are these Galileans? I, I can hear them. They're speaking Greek and they're speaking Virgin and Pamphylian and whatever all the languages are. You know, they're utterly amazed. They're speaking our languages. But some of them came to the conclusion that these guys are drunk. And says so some of them, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure if I were God, I'd have left it up to question what was going on that day to the thing where actually people could look at it, perceive and think that they were drunk. See, they were under the influence. The Bible says, don't get drunk with wine, Ephesians 5, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, be under the influence of the Spirit. Drunk? Well, there it is. I don't think they were standing up there like one at a time, just being really nice and speaking in tongues and then saying, next. Next, next. That's how we would organize the church in today's most churches. Okay, Peter, your turn. Okay, John. No, 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 no disorder here. No, come on, speak. No. no, they're all speaking tongues at the same time. It looked like chaos. It looked like they were drunk. God started his church this way. That should be a sign to you. Read your Bible. Here's another one. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are higher than yours. That should give you another clue. If it's too much like you, you're probably missing someone or something from God. Just remember how you got saved and all the issues around that. How is it that we can some come into this sort of nice intellectual sort of and organize God so well, but God won't be organized. He's not like that. He does things on his own terms, when he wants, how he wants. That's how he does business. And the sooner we cope with that, the easier it's going to be for us to walk with this God who actually brings order, but his own order. He brings plans, but his own plans. I know I got the plans I got to you for you to give you a future and a home. They're all good. They're all positive, but they can be confusing at times. And boy, I'll tell you what. Everybody's confused. And so Peter stands up and says, you know what? These guys aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning here. Let me tell you what's going on. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even in my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Now the end days, the last days started at the resurrection continues down to this day, in my opinion, we're at the end of the end days. <laughs> but nevertheless, we're still in this dispensation of the Spirit. Now here's an interesting thing to help you read through Acts. It's really, really important because just in the verses I read, just in Acts 1 and Acts 2, you'll notice as you read through those verses, you'll notice that this baptism of the Holy Spirit has synonyms. There are Luke's synonyms. So when you read through the pages of the New Testament, you understand what he's talking about. Like for example, at the end, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Well, if you look through the pages, you understand that receiving the Spirit is just a synonym for baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's a, several of them. One is the word gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Another one is receive power or receive the gift. But the word receive is in there. Another one is pour out my spirit. Another one is Holy Spirit came on them. Another one is filled with the Holy Spirit. So baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, Holy Spirit comes on you. All of those are synonyms for the same experience that happened in Acts chapter 2. But the surprising thing about the whole deal is that by the time we get to Acts chapter 4, we see again the same disciples gathered. Peter and John got arrested and then released. And the strange thing is, they're there praying before God after this release. And they say, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants, this is Acts 4.29, to speak your word with great boldness. They're asking for boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. This is just the normal way. They've recommitted to the vision. They've recommitted. This is what we do. We do signs and wonders. Help us with the signs and wonders. We volunteer. We don't care if it gets us thrown in jail, killed. We don't care. We're abandoned. Whatever it costs, we're going to do your work. But then, they, then it says after they prayed, God really liked that prayer, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now this is some of the same believers that got at Pentecost and some of the same disciples that got on the first day of the resurrection. So this is the third time. Evidently we leak. <laughs> Receive the Holy Spirit. First day. Resurrects first evening. 50 late, days later. Baptized in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues. Build the Holy Spirit. A few days later. A few months later. However long it was. A whole bunch of other people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They get refilled. So then you can be refilled and filled and refilled and filled. So you don't take your baptism of the Holy Spirit and experience you had. You, oh, I, I did that already. I spoke already. You know, I bought the t-shirt. By the way, <laughs> Barry was standing here. And I'm going to get to this in a minute. Barry, you're back there. Stand up, Barry. So look what's on his t-shirt today. You're a sign and wonder today. Come Holy Spirit on his t-shirt. You're, you're, man, you're the only person that just got it, man. <laughs> Come Holy Spirit. So, you got the t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 15 years ago, I received my prayer language. It was great. I haven't heard from God or done anything to God since. I never hear Him speak. I never do anything. But boy, I tell you, that was a great time I spoke that time. I got my badge. I can hang out legally in any charismatic or Pentecostal of your church. I'm good. Wow. We do that. We canonize things. We have this way of doing this. It must drive God crazy. See, the filling of the Holy Spirit is meant to be a, a, a experience all the time. New encounters, new experiences, new growth, new insight, right? We just see this in these three times right there at the, the beginning of Acts. We haven't even gotten through the rest of Acts. How many times before Paul is going to speak or preach? Peter's going to speak. And the, you'll see in the parentheses and he was filled with the Holy Spirit began to whatever, right? We desperately need to walk in this reality. Now, this reality we're talking about isn't just a single dimension. It's not just a point in time a long time ago, but sometimes it helps to understand three dimensions of the power of, of the Spirit of God. Okay, and I'm going to mention these three dimensions. And how, so God's multidimensional in the way He responds to us, the way He, he ministers His Spirit to us. So here's the first one I'm going to mention. It's the dimension of power. This is what he told him in the beginning. You'll see power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And we look at Acts chapter 4. And we see that they asked for boldness. And God was more than happy to give them boldness, right? And so here's how the power dimension. You've had this encounter with God. Then what you can bank on is that when you step out in faith to witness to somebody, to pray for somebody that's sick. In other words... When you walk in the room, you just became the answer to every problem in that office, every problem in that store. That's how you have to see yourself. you got Christ in your name. And I won't say this sacrilegiously, but when I walk into Walmart, Jesus just walked in the door. <laughs> and if there's something undone, somebody's sick, somebody that needs something, somebody that needs a word, somebody that needs encouragement, I'm on. And God can use me. You don't have to be particularly discerning about it at times either. I mean, if they're not doing well, they're not doing well. I, I watch people all the time, you know. Sometimes I get in the habit now, I can see a person depressed, and I'll just go up to them and say, oh, man, you're having a bad day, huh? He says, oh, man, you know what I've been saying. What's wrong? Then pretty soon you get in this conversation, and I just become Jesus. I just 
start ministering to them. Simple as that. You don't have to be super bad, but you got the power. You got the power. I wish I could say like TJ Jakes. And, 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 and she doesn't know him. I keep walking that. Here's the important thing. Peter walked on water after he walked on water. Man, Peter, what an amazing thing. Okay, you sunk, but boy, I sure wish I could talk to you. What did that feel like to walk on those waves <laughs> just for a little bit, you know? But that was just training. Peter walking on water, you give him something. To eat. These are all phrases. They were the intentions of God, not just for those disciples, for them to pass on to all the generations all the way down to the 21st century. You are water walkers. You are food multipliers. You are power releasers. You are anointed. Amen. And when you forget that, all you do is dribble. Ugh. I you know, just came. Ugh. And then the, the church makes it worse because to actually minister to somebody, you're supposed to memorize a whole set of things and get everything perfect. Right. So whatever we do, we do not want to offend the person. But sometimes a person needs to be offended. Somebody needs to break in their space and say, what are you doing? You're going to destroy yourself. Sometimes that's appropriate. Other times it's just more of a gentle thing or whatever, but sometimes you, you can be like a, a, like a velvet covered, uh, I mean like a, I sometimes I think of myself like I've got a glove on, but I've got a punch inside that glove, you know? Like a velvet covered brick, that's what I was looking for, right? So how did Peter walk? Jesus said, I'm going to build on you, Peter. You're my rock. And guess what? I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What do the keys of the kingdom look like? Well, first thing, Pentecost comes. He's the guy who stands up and says, you know, we're not all drunk. <laughs> and then he risks his life. He steps out because he had power. He realized the power and he steps out. And I know when he stepped out there, he didn't know exactly what was going to happen. He had to walk on water. It's the first sermon ever preached. And he's accusing all of Jerusalem for murdering Jesus. And they just murdered him a few days ago. It was risky. But he stepped out of that power and he begins to preach the gospel. We're not drunk, but this is what Joel said. And he begins to explain the whole thing to them. And 3,000 people come to Jesus Christ. But what we might not appreciate is that we always assume these disciples just had it all together and everything and they were just being... No, he had took some guts. I didn't see the other 11 stepping up there. He stepped up. That's why he was the rock. He had the initial key. I'm preaching to the Jews. But it went on just a few days later. He's walking by this guy. He's been laying for all these years. He's just remembering his training from Jesus. And he says, you know what? Lame guy, silver and gold, I don't have, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. So he grabs him by the hand. I've always thought how funny it would have been if, you know, if it didn't work. And he grabs him by the hand, the guy plops on his face. Then what do we do, you know? He took a risk. He stepped out. So this whole thing of power, usually power, this power of the Holy Spirit is released through R-I-S-K. Oh, we hate R-I-S-K. We want to just, I got my badge, I got my tongues. But, oh, this risk thing. I don't want to go out and let anybody know. Matter of fact, I don't even want to let my own relatives know about this because it's a little controversial and everything. But I'm a secret, charismatic person. You know, I'm all, you know, I got my badge, you know. <laughs> if you're a charismatic person, the power is released by stepping out, being brave. So there we go. Peter again. He heals this guy. Now we have 5,000 converts. First he preaches the message, then he heals the guy. And they're going crazy. 5,000 people just out of 2x, but it took both and he stepped into the power. Right? Then, he gets himself in another mess. The Gentiles. And he finds himself in a place where, actually at that time, they thought it was totally unscriptural. Can I just say that again? We're all back here, like, yeah, of course, how stupid, you know, it's not the law. But those Judean Christians, those Jewish Christians, they thought that what he was doing by going to a Gentile's house was against the Bible. They thought he was being unbiblical. He had to explain himself. And he didn't even know what to do about it. He's feeling uncomfortable. He's being carried. The Holy Spirit, obviously, he's, there's revelation that's been given on Cornelius. Then he see, saw an angel. And there's revelation he's got on his end. And he's just walking in there, you know, with all these Jewish guys. And they're looking around trying to figure out what in the world's going on. What am I doing here? And he starts off his sermon. It's interesting. You know I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> so he starts the sermon. You know, I'm not really supposed to be here. <laughs> You guys, Gentiles were Jews. You know, Jesus called, even called you dogs. You know, I don't think he said that part. But anyway, you know, I mean, and Jesus really didn't do that. He just with that one woman, you know, who was trying to draw her out. But the, but the common name for Gentiles was dogs. It wasn't good. So somewhere on the inside of him, he 
pulled on that power and he stepped out. He starts preaching anyway. And the Spirit, thank God it happened this way because none of them would have laid hands on those poor Gentiles. So the Spirit of God had to just fall on them. God gave them a little help. Just fell and they start speaking in tongues and praising God and they are utterly and completely amazed and flabbergasted. But the point is, they weren't trying to do that at all. None of that. They were even figuring what they were doing. They thought, okay, there was an angel. Okay, I have a little visitation myself. So I'm just going to respond a little bit. And that's the way power works. You just respond to what you got and then God gives you the rest. Oh, we want it all full blown and know exactly what to do. It's rarely power works that way. It always works like you just take a chance on whatever relationship you got. You think you might have saw something or recognized something in someone. You thought maybe you could be of help to someone. Maybe you could pray for them. Just do a little bit and fear and trembling and there the power comes. That's the way power is always released. We wish it was a different way, but this is not for the faint of heart. If you're going to walk in the spirit of Pentecost, you just got to believe and step out and risk. That's how power is released. Okay. Right? You always know I'm excited when my hands go really fast like this. So they start videoing me, and I notice the first thing I do, they do this a lot. So that means anointing's on me, right? It's very distracting, though. I'm going to stop doing that. All right. So here's the next dimension of the Spirit. It's love. Now, sometimes it gets kind of confusing because the love of the Spirit works a little bit differently. So for years, I functioned in the power of the Spirit. I went from one end of this earth to the other, about a full decade of that. Just learn to speak in tongues. And from that time, uh, I had that encounter with God. But can I just say that for a moment? I just got a little taste of God when I spoke in tongues. The thing is, about it is I, I just needed to believe in Jesus, walk with the Lord as a teenager, but I just needed to feel a taste of the supernatural. I just needed to know that on the inside, I, I needed an encounter with Him. Not only my salvation, I just needed a little extra. I needed that baptism. I needed that immersion in the Spirit. And when I got that, just by speaking simply in tongues, and the whole thing excited me so much, I never looked back. I began to read through my Bible. I began to pray. I began to witness and share. And I ended up at the wrong university, in the wrong place, in the wrong everything. I did everything backwards. As a matter of fact, the guy, when I first got baptized, the Holy Spirit says, you know what? You're going to spend your whole life going in the back door. And I did. You know, I'm supposed to go to this college. I end up at Oral Roberts University. Mary Janice, I'm supposed to be in medicine, and I end up, and I go to medical school only to discover I run across a guy, you know, a new church plant, and I end up leaving medical school, and I end up going, and up, and then for, I'm supposed to be in, in Oklahoma, and I end up in, in the farthest reaches of the world, and I end up in Hawaii, and I'm going to just do it all, and I just went on a ride. But I got the end of that ride for a while because I had a huge disappointment happen, some of you know my story. So about the 10th year of that, and then I got ambushed again, but this time it was different. This time it was with the love of God. I didn't know that. Thank God, because I thought I was having a nervous breakdown, frankly, but thank God for the leaders around me at that time that helped me explain, no, you're just experiencing what we call the love of the Father. And I said, oh my gosh, well, that's that why I'm crying all the time? Yeah. Because I said, I don't really feel that bad about the circumstance. I just can't stop crying. I just feel tenderized. I can't, I go to bed at night, I, that's all I can think is Jesus, and I'm I feel love everywhere, and I just feel like, you know that, what's that story of that bowl that, you know, that got, became feminine, started smelling, what was his name? Ferdinand. Ferdinand. I felt like Ferdinand the bowl. That's exactly what I felt like. Just love the flowers and love everything and everybody, you know, and everything. I was just so, so unlikely. I don't believe I cried a, a day in my life. I only can't even remember one time I cried. And all the years that preceded that, until the day the love of the Father came, and then I couldn't stop crying. And my wife was looking at me just wondering, what in the heck is going on here? And I had spent months like this. Thank God Eddie Bjork was around to help me understand that this is this is normal. So how can this be normal? I feel like I'm I I feel like a sissy. <laughs> I felt like I, I felt like I was getting a Hold of this feminine side of me and it was just like whoa man i just and then i'm thinking then my, the worst horror thought i remember going through my mind is oh my gosh i've become like all the other vineyard people i'm out of my mind <laughs> i've totally lost to like everybody else i used to like make fun of them even thinking i thought maybe all the crazy people all gathered in one place and they came to the vineyard and that's why they acted the way they did because i couldn't i don't understand how anybody could be that uh, uh, open and and even 
sensitive to God, you know, and then it happened to me. But it was the dimension of love. And so we had a whole conference on this recently with Eddie. And, uh, but to me, there's two passages that seem incredibly important to me about this. This part of God, this dimension of God is received. It's more of a contemplation. It's more of an inner work. It's more of a work of art. God comes to us in these personal ways. It's what we call a work intimacy. It's, it's not like power. Power is stepped into, but compassion is received. Compassion, just this God putting his arm around you and telling you how much he loved you. And I tell you, it's such a relief. You put the power and the compassion together and you begin to really walk in the spirit of God. This compassion was such a welcome addition to my life. And I began to understand passages I never had understood for years. Like Paul praying for the Ephesians in chapter 3 was always an amazing thing to me. He's praying for these Ephesians, by the way, in that same Ephesians that lost their first love, according to John. So he's praying for them. He says, and I pray that you may be rooted and established in love. That's verse uh, 17 of Ephesians 3. May have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Oh, that's easy to read. But when you begin to experience it, it's dramatic. You begin to realize how much Jesus really loves you in your spirit. Not just in your brain. Not just after, you know, rote memory. Jesus loves me so for the Bible tells me so. I mean earthquake things in the inside. That's how wide, how long, how high and deep is the love of Christ. He said, boy, oh, Ephesians, I'm praying for you. You'll get the hold of that revelation. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. I got so filled with the measure of the fullness of God, I didn't think there was anything left to fill. Not a hymn was able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So what we're talking about is a power that's at work within us that leads us to this amazing love. First John says it so clearly. First John, he says, we love because he first loved us. There's no truer scripture in the Bible. You can take that mentally, but when you get unraveled by the sheer grandeur and beauty of how much Abba Daddy loves you, you don't have any problem loving anybody else. That's what I found. The amazing thing was it helped the power dimension because now I just loved everybody. Now I have this tenderness for them. And Jesus said, you know, Father, I only do it for the Father loves us and, and shows him all that he's doing. So when the explosion of love goes off in your heart, you begin to see what he's doing. And then the power part means you just step into it. Even though you've got the motivation, you still have to risk and step out. But these are two dimensions of the Spirit. And there, a third one that's related to all of it is actually in, we call it revelation. And so we see that in this age of the Spirit, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants. So everybody, young, old, men, women, I'll pour out my Spirit. And then it says, and they will prophesy. So part of the movement of the Spirit is that you have revelation. You can actually... Prophesy, you see visions, you begin to hear from God. Now, revelatory things, the sense of them is if power is stepped into and love is yielded to or received, revelation is both. It's both a stepping in and a receiving. It's got both attention, uh, both, both dimensions in it. And also, uh, the Spirit of God brings this revelation. Here's one of my favorite dimensions of it, is how you need wisdom for a problem. Most of us need wisdom for some sort of problem. The thing about it is the Spirit brings wisdom. He brings wisdom. It's the Spirit of wisdom that helps you finally, when the light bulb comes on and you know what to do, I live for those moments. So you need revelation. You need God to tell you what to do. But also that anointing is through you for other people. I don't make any uh, apologies for how much prophetic works around you. It's normal. Read the book. We don't do it perfectly, and maybe we get out of bounds sometimes, but we're always trying to see visions and to hear God's voice because it's normal. That's in the Holy Spirit, and it takes a little risk at times. But here's a great place to start. Why don't you just start with your Bible? Great place to start with Revelation. So people think, well, I don't have any Revelation in me. Well, just start reading your Bible every day because you know what? The Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is God-breathed. Just like Jesus...
breathed on those disciples, God breathes on the scripture. And when you read the Bible, guess what? And you pay attention and just listen. God will reveal things to you. I read my Bible constantly because it helps the revelatory part of my life because you know what? God has this tendency to like the Bible. <laughs> and we treat it like a discipline. Oh my gosh. Just if you treat the Bible as a discipline, just stop. Stop doing that. Stop it. <laughs> Man doesn't live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You're, those are your words you live by. And there's revelation in them. And when you read the experience of another person, or you read about a promise, that promise is for you to apply in your life. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is always brooding over His Word. And when you read the Bible, what happens is you get activated on the inside of that same revelation you get from the Scripture about something in your life or an insight or how to walk with God or a way to be blessed or a way to bless somebody else. That whole insight that you get from the Bible is the same way He walks with you in over everyday life when you discover something or you see something over somebody or you prophesy to someone, you declare a word over them. Matter of fact, a lot of your vocabulary comes from the Bible. I never have understood how sometimes Pentecostal people or charismatic people dis dissociate from their Bible. In that sense, the mainline evangelical church is absolutely right. But you know what? If you've got the Spirit of God in you, will read your Bible from cover to cover over and over again. I'm telling you. Because you'll find in that space the living words that are alive. They're not just on a page. This book is God-breathed. Just like Jesus breathed on those disciples. That's why I stay in the Bible all the time. Twice through the New Testament, once through the Old Testament. Every single year, going through, and I study and I look at it, and I, I take my NIV study Bible, and I find I write notes in it. My Bible, my other Bible looks horrible, so if you see it, I mean, I don't even know how to fix it, because i got so many things written in there, I don't want to get rid of it. I don't know how to get it covered. If I didn't know how to cover your Bible, please tell me. I can't find there. I almost disappeared off the face of the earth in this area, so if you know. Because I, I don't want to lose my Bible. I can't lose all those messages, all those things I've written to myself, right? So I'm getting revelation from it. The Holy Spirit's the spirit of truth. He leads you into the truth. But the truth shall set you free. The truth about who you really are. As far as I'm concerned, one of the main truths you got to know is how great you got it with God. How for He is for you. How <laughs> for you is He for you. How He wants to be on your side. How much He loves you. How much compassion He has in you. And you know, you can only get that from the spirit. The spirit of truth will show you those things. There's a difference between the spirit of condemnation and the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is always leading you to a higher ground, always encouraging, always pushing you forward. You know that because of the great compassion you have from God, from the Holy Spirit. You read the Bible of the Holy Spirit, and guess what? It's amazing things. Pay attention to your Bible. But here is another thing I've learned. The main thing about revelation is pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention to your surroundings. God is always speaking. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I thought he only spoke a little bit over here, a little bit over there, you know, years ago, <laughs> over there once in a while. But here's in Revelation. Can I just say to you, he's the God of Revelation. He got you a whole book. That's how you know he talks a lot. <laughs> oh, he only talks in the book. Oh, really? Really? You know what he says in Romans chapter 1? Did you know that no one, no one is exempt? Even if they haven't heard about Jesus. Do you know what? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, clear as a bell, that He's revealed Himself and is speaking through all creation. And no man is without excuse because the Bible and everything, I mean the world and all that He's created is a revelation of God itself. People should know God just by the world. He's always talking. The heavens talk. Nature talks. Everything around us, He's always speaking. Pay attention to your surroundings. Notice things. 1 Corinthians 14, 29... 33 it's very interesting even in the early church we see these passages and as they're unfolding and as the early church began to find its bearing and began to function the letters that are written back and forth to all of us some of the assumptions but behind these early believers is the same assumptions we function on right first Corinthians chapter 14 this is what he says just, just a few verses give you a taste of this what should we say I'm going to start with verse 26. Brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. We all can hear God's voice. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak. 
The other should wait carefully what is said. If a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. For you may all prophesy in turn, so everyone can be instructed and encouraged. You can all prophesy, every one of you. It's part of your heritage. You shall see visions. You will see dream dreams. You'll prophesy. So prophesying culture is just normal. It's ordinary. Sometimes when people come and hang out with us in a smaller meeting, or like, maybe like Monday night where we do a lot of more ministry with regard to person to person, it's astounding. And one of my favorite things to do is take a person, and I've done it twice in the last month, who I, I know has never prophesied, and I bring them up to the front. I say, hey, let's want to prophesy, you know, and so they come up, and then I just tell them, here's what you do. You just pay attention, tell someone out in the group, get something highlighted to you. Okay? So you just look while I'm doing some other things, then I come back to them, and you, some of you have seen me do this before, and then I just say, okay, so you got one? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, that lady over there kind of interests me. I say, really? And yeah, I say, okay, so what do you think? So they start talking about her, right? And then before you know it, they've got a full prophecy they've never prophesied before in their life. Well, is that, you know, it looks like I'm taking such a huge risk and all that, and they never prophesied, and I got in front of a group of people, but you know, I got a secret. You may all prophesy. I already know what's under the hood if you're a believer. I already know. It's in the hood. It's underneath the hood. It's right there. I know how powerful you are. That whole revelation part. And it's all through the scripture, this revelatory thing. We are people who can hear the voice of God. Can I say it again? We are people who can hear the voice of God. And don't let the enemy or circumstance lie to you. You can hear the voice of God. Now, he might not speak to you about your particular problem in exactly the way you want them, but he has lots of things to say. Sometimes a problem comes, he's got a lot of other things he wants to say, and then I'll get back to the original problem. So we just want to talk about the real problem. But he wants to talk about, oh, let's talk about this too. Let's talk about that. Can I get your attention? Let's talk about over here. No, I don't want to talk about it. I got the problem. No, let's talk about this for a while. And if you listen to that, you'll get around to the problem. We don't want to listen like that because actually God lets problems in just to bless us and help us. We always increase, not decrease. We're for good. Not bad. We're for nothing. All things are working together for our good according to God's purpose in Christ Jesus, right? Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 21. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at me. He says, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. The whole thing is that we all participate. We all have something to offer. We all have revelation that we walk in. All right, so I'm going to finish with this. 2 Timothy 1.7. So some of you have read this before, and I, it's very interesting because in the midst of all of this supernatural thing I'm talking about, there is a thing in the Bible called a sound mind. <laughs> and so I'm going to read it, all right? For the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us, the Spirit of God, again, gives us power. We mentioned that, love. But then he puts in the word self-discipline. That's weird. Now, the problem with this word is it's translated in about 15 different ways. Some Bibles say self-control. Some say self-discipline. Some say sound mind. Some say sound judgment. Because it's one of the Greek words that's really hard to translate. But the, I like what, what Barclay says about it. He says it's the, san, it's the sanity of soul, of, of saintless, of, of, of saintliness. <laughs> the sanity of being a saint. Sanity of being a Christian. There is a sanity. There's a soberness that God gives us. And a way of thinking and understanding that God gives. He gives a certain reasonableness about us. So even with regard to supernatural things. He's got this Corinthian church and they're all speaking in tongues. You know, they're blah, 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 blah. You know, they're so excited. You know, in a culture like that that doesn't have secular humanism, but much of the world's like this, you can't imagine how it would be. But my guess is they're probably going to church and they walk in the door, da 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 speaking in tongues. They're all wearing their tongues like a badge, you know. They're so enamored. They know it's supernatural. It's pretty cool. And every once in a while they'll speak in a language somebody else understands. And it's just like a badge of honor. And they're just doing all this. He said, no, wait a minute. Come in. Just, just go back to a sound mind here for a moment. <laughs> okay, look, if you do that, in church, it's going to be hard for us to get anything out of church because you're all speaking a language. Isn't it obvious to everybody? So let's just take our sound mind, and this is what we're going to do. So here's how we're going to do this. Uh, when you speak in a tongue, you got to interpret. And don't only do two or three like that, and don't forget to prophesy because prophecy is easier because you're speaking a language everybody can understand. Everybody's encouraged. So if you have it, uh, speak in tongues and get an interpretation. Simple, right? 
So that kind of stuff. Like some people don't understand. I, I have gotten so secure because I'm abandoned to the Holy Spirit. I've got that whole sound mind part in. Because I've embraced so many things. And, and it's funny thing is you can't put it in a box. Because if you put it too much in a box, and pretty soon you're, you're going to go into that play where you're controlling the Holy Spirit. But I like all these strange expressions. I'm coping with the shofar still when it's blown for no apparent reason in the congregation. But you know what? I'm not afraid anymore to those shofars for quenching the spirit. I say, it's not time. You can't blow that darn thing in the middle of like kumbaya. You gotta make change. You know, you gotta make you gotta do it at the right moment, right? But now I go, okay, now, go, 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 do it now. Now, yeah, now, right now. Then you blow that thing? Good. Order. Sound mind. Discipline. Don't just blow everybody just like coming. Then you can't play your tambourine when the drummer's trying to get the beat. You're banging that thing out there. Bang, bang, bang. You can't do that. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just worshiping the Lord. Well, yeah, but you're messing with the rest of our worship. The, guy, the drummer can perfect. He keeps hearing what you're doing. He can't even think. Right? Then there's other times when I just realize God tells me, you know, I have God, I have no explanation whatsoever what they're doing. But it looks like the Holy Spirit, so I'm going to leave it alone. So I just leave it alone, try not to look over there. <laughs> no, I've done that a lot. You know, and, and Andrew showed up. Is Andrew, are you in here? I saw you earlier. Oh, he's over at the school of ministry. So Andrew's the guy with the big flags. He's the flag guy. Anybody knows the guy with the huge flags? I don't see him as much on Sunday morning because he's afraid he's going to poke somebody's eye out here because, because it's too crowded. But he's got this big flag, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's huge. I mean, they're like giant. They're as big as that door, right? He's wagging them on. When he first came, I thought, that's one of the ones I looked the other direction about, you know? But over time, I began to notice how he was doing it. And I could feel the presence of God on him. So I just met him at the door, literally, and we kind of figured it out and everything. Now and then, like three months later, I, I found myself taking the pulpit. I said, get up there on the stage and do that now. You know? Because I didn't know what to do at first, but then... But I realize what he does, there's a prophetic thing in it. Sometimes there's a statement. So, so we get to a certain place in worship, and he comes up here and starts doing that, and then the thing is, you can feel the Spirit of God coming everywhere, but it's a flag. So if I, then I notice that the children really like to do it. They like waving those flags. I thought, that's good. They, they have something they can do in worship. They understand all the stuff they can. Oh, that's good. So we cleared the whole space for them. Now they wave the flags, and they're too noisy. I'm trying to notice that, but it's okay. Because it's order. It's got the right order. It's okay. And, not all. and then with regard to the way we handle prophecy in the service. You know, we don't mind. We, we would rather if you get a word or something you got from the Lord to just come into the mind, come to me, and I, I can evaluate it and see if it's appropriate for the service. Because here's the deal. And we're 300 or 400 people are gathered together. The guy in the back row, you know, he starts prophesying. But to reach everybody, he's got to pretty well scream it all the way out to go all the way over here and back around the corner. And it kills the first seven rows over there, you know, because he's screaming and they're going, oh, what happened? You know, I don't hear a word he said. These guys can barely hear him. They can't hear a word he said. Me better just come call me, get the gist of it, and put it on the mic and say it. So, or I'll say it. Or if you've got a word of knowledge in a larger assembly, Fernando does that all the time. He gives me these words and then I just sort of release them. Sometimes words of knowledge. In larger assemblies, it's different. In smaller settings, it doesn't really matter because you're in that setting and you don't have to, you know, it's just, you're okay, God. God's got a sound mind. And my favorite part, and I'll end with this, is Galatians. Because it just tells us how deeply these thoughts that I'm having were ingrained in the early church. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. And here's what he's making his appeal. He's appealing because of the religiosity of these people. They are, they're religious. They're getting back into Judaistic process, uh, 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 issues and the law. And, and, and these Jews are coming to try to help them to know the way better to walk with God. Because they're the kind of elder person, the brother. They were, it was given to them first. And they've got all the prophets and the learning. So these people were very susceptible. These young congregations were anybody Jewish that came around and started teaching. But they would teach from this legalistic point of view. The Jews were having a really hard time with the Gentiles anyway, so they started putting regulations and things on them. So this church was going that way. But listen to what he says. It helps us understand this uh, intensity, this understanding of the spirit that the early church had that we need to have. I would like to learn just one thing from you. He's, he's combating this. Listen to what he says. Did you receive the spirit? That's his, that's his argument. By the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? 
Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Just by raw belief and receiving the promises, the things that we have in God. Does He work miracles? In other words, the Spirit has to be free. But when I said sound mind, there's the, the true freedom is found in being completely open and then at the same time being jealous for that openness so that it works for everybody the right time. There's a balance there. But they got out of balance. They, they got into the Word, but they got so deep that they forgot this freedom, the miraculous, the love of God, the revelation of God, the power of God. And so one of my main jobs in this church from the time I started until now for our 20th year is to make sure this culture doesn't ever leave because in our culture and the culture of churches around us, it's so easy to lose these concepts. And it was easy for the early church, even this Galatian church was losing their heritage, losing the beauty and the power of God in the name of Scripture, for heaven's sake. I think if you read your Bibles with the viewpoint I've given you, it's really the biblical point of view. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? But always keep that first and foremost. The Bible will help you, make you a great Bible scholar, make you a great teacher, make you a great evangelist, whatever you need to be, a great business person. In every way, depend on the Lord for your life. Because we're not our own, right? Amen. Let's all stand. So the next several weeks as we're at this holiday of Pentecost, my prayer is, Lord, we refurbish us in all the dimensions. On Pentecost night, we're going to have a special time for people to come into maybe some of the beginnings of the dimensions of the Spirit with regard to speaking in tongues and being baptized with the Holy Spirit. We do that in our classes. If you want to come early, come in Life in the Spirit. We're always doing that in Life in the Spirit class. I do it all year long from September all the way through uh, the early part of June. Always. Some of you just need to be loved again. You need to feel God's love in your circumstance. You need to hear Him call you by name. Some of you this morning need revelation about a problem. You need the wisdom of God or you need revelation about something else. About your life or your surroundings or something. Some of you want to walk in more revelation like prophecy and hear God's voice better. So there's these dimensions, power, love, and revelation. And I believe that they're all impartable. I didn't get into that subject, didn't have time, but the truth of the matter is when we see the Spirit being imparted, many times it's imparted by the laying on of hands and there's a response. Three times in the book of Acts, we see disciples laying hands on people and they receive this baptism or this filling of the Holy Spirit. The other three times, nobody laid hands on them. Like the Christians at Antioch, I mean Christians at uh, was the city they were at. Where Paul or Peter visited him was the name of that city. Caesarea? Yeah, Caesarea. The Spirit just fell on them, right? Pentecost, the Spirit just fell on them. So either way. But I just want to make space today, like we do all the time. But I think for me preaching on this, somebody need to go home to listening, being revelation, to receiving love, and to being bold with power circumstances. So if you'd just like to revisit that place in your own life today, why don't you just come up to the front. And I'm just going to ask the Lord to bring an impartation today. And some of you are going to be surprised. We all need different things. If you need intimacy, just relax and ask the Lord to bring His love. Ask God to bring Abba. If you've wanted to be a witness and a testimony and you don't want to shrink back and you want to see signs and wonders and miracles through your prayers and your preaching, you want to be a witness, you want to really lead people to Christ. Let's ask God for boldness. Do you know, that's what they did in Acts chapter 4. Guess what? If we ask God for boldness, He likes that prayer because He filled them with the Holy Spirit right after. Bring revelation today, Lord, over our circumstances, over our difficult problems. Not just in this service today, but I pray the impartation we receive today.
would go with us outside of this auditorium. I want you to equip us. Can I have some people that will just pray for people today? Not be afraid to pray for them. But you may have just the word they need today. Or just the impartation in your hands for them today. For them to move on in the Lord. So I have somebody just begin to circulate and pray for people. Holy Spirit, I want you to know you're welcome here. You're always welcome here. We love your work. We love what you do. We love that you reveal the Bible to us. We love that you encourage us. We love that you bring that deep compassion. We love that you bring revelation for our situations. We love that you teach us how to pray. We love everything about you. As we're here, would you rest on us? Would you encourage us? We yield. And we want to be good receivers today. We receive your salvation, now we receive you all over again. Come. The other day I was walked in the Wednesday night and I was feeling a little bit far from God. And the worship like he's playing just began. And I could feel the Father's love because I've had a taste of it. And I just could feel it and blanketing the whole place. I can feel that blanket on people again today. Just the, the love of God is resting. Son of the Most High God. 